I want to give a little background uh, about my, my life as I tell this story. And uh, I grew up in an Irish Italian family. We were five kids. We grew up on a dairy farm. So we were well acquainted with uh, hard work and uh, developed a strong work ethic. We uh, valued, my parents really valued education. And all five of us kids went to 12 years of private Catholic school and then on to the public <laughs> universities. Uh, mostly to get away from the work on the farm. Uh, when you grow up on a farm, you realize that uh, white collar work is really the way to go. And so everybody in my family, no one works uh, on the farm. Everybody is in white collar jobs. And uh, I would say, I think it's fair to say that my brothers and sisters are pretty much all um, overachievers and workaholics. So uh, dairy farm work kind of does that to you. You're there every day twice a day, never get a vacation. And, um, but what that also led to was we had a, a family dinner every night. And uh, at the same time, every day, you kind of learn a pretty strict, strict uh, ritual. And around our dinner table, um, <clears throat> we had lots of debates. We, uh, we had a really um, quite, we learned how to really uh, stand up for what you believe in, speak it out, and uh, don't be afraid to counter what, what that is and try to use facts if you can. Um, my parents were wonderful people. My mom, um, when I thought about my parents, uh, about how to share with you what they were, I realized that my mom really taught uh, us how to live on a micro level and how to deal with people one-on-one. -on -one. She was, um, she is my greatest hero and the kind of person that you wish everyone could meet. She, uh, she's a living example of kindness, compassion, forgiveness, and ultimately, unconditional love. She's the kind of person that, um, if, you, if you walk into the room, no one probably noticed her. But if you got on a bus and sat next to her, you would tell her your life story. And uh, she was just the, one of the kindest people I've ever met in my life. She, uh, she used to say things to us like, uh, you know, when you see somebody, smile at them. Because it really makes them feel good, and it doesn't cost anything. So do what you can to help people. Uh, she would say things like, um, find the good in every person. She, she would never gossip. She absolutely did not do that. But she would say things like, you know, it's easy to find the negative things in people. That's, anybody can do that. But every person is, has fundamental goodness. And so no matter how bad the person is, find that goodness and tell them about it. And it'll make them a better person. She, uh, she would tell us uh, if we were in a store and there was somebody struggling with groceries, she'd always encourage us to run over and help that lady with her groceries. And she just taught us how to be nice to people one-on-one. -on -one. She really, she was just a really great person. I would always uh, bring home friends from college to meet her. And I, I, I realized in college what an incredible person she was. And uh, I wanted as many people as I could to get to meet her. And, and she was a great Italian cook. So we, I would always bring some, there was always somebody with me coming home on, on uh, holidays. Um, my dad, on the other hand, he's, he's the Irish, and uh, he kind of gave us uh, a vision of how to live on a macro level. He was really into politics. He was actually a small town politician, and uh, he liked to think about policy and discuss world politics and the problems of the world, and, and he had a lot of solutions for that. And uh, he actually was an elected official. Uh, he was on the county board, and he was a guy that, uh, he, he was very independent-minded. He, he owned two businesses. He ran a dairy farm, and he also ran a tree business. And uh, he would say things to us like, um, um, be a leader. If we would come home with a, a goofy haircut or, you know, some weird clothes, he, he would always say, why, why, do you, why do you have a haircut like that? And we'd say, well, everybody has it, Dad. I mean, it's, it's the style. It's everybody has it. And this was, if I heard this once, I heard it a thousand times. So if everybody jumped off a cliff naked, would you jump off the cliff too? And, uh, and then he would say, don't follow the crowd. Lead the crowd. Another thing he would tell us was, um, you can be whatever you want to be. And you can do whatever you want to do. And don't ever let anyone tell you that you can't do what you think you should do. And uh, so we grew up with a, a lot of um, a, a lot of passionate character development in, our, in my family. And um, it, was a, it was an interesting, interesting family. And other areas in my life that helped develop my character were, um, because I grew up with my brothers, um, and, and there was a family down the road, they had three, three boys and a girl too. So 
you know, two girls, six boys, we became pretty good athletes. Uh, we did a lot of playing on the farm. Our farm was turned into every kind of athletic field you could imagine. And, um, and when I got to eighth grade, I know this doesn't sound like a big deal now, but back then it really was. I was elected class president, and I was the first girl in the school history to be elected class president. And the same year, I was elected the local 4-H club um, president. And uh, I learned how to do uh, Robert's Rules of Order. And, and at an early age, I, I learned how to run a meeting. And I was given a lot of great leadership skill. I remember, um, not only were my parents really influential in my life, but lots of teachers and people. And uh, I remember in eighth grade, one of my favorite teachers, Sister Lorencia, uh, one day I was leading a, a, a class meeting. And I was like this, ah, OK, who's bringing cupcakes next uh, week? And I was kind of like that. And then from the back of the room, I heard Sister Lorencia say, say um, Madam President, I said, yes. Are you the president of the class? I said, yes. And she said, then stand up straight and act like it. <laughs> act like a president. <coughs> and uh, there were a couple of one-liners that Sister Lorencia told me that I have never forgotten. <laughs> and that is one of them. So usually at a podium, I'm kind of like this. You know? <laughs> uh, but I had a great chance to, to, to have some real leadership um, as a young person. One of the things that I realized uh, as I look back was that um, I had kind of a deep sense of justice from an early age. I remember about third or fourth grade, uh, I was on the playground, and I saw this one of my classmates, one of the boys, was kind of teasing a first grade girl. And he was kind of over her, and he was, she had glasses on, and he was calling her four eyes, four eyes, four eyes. And she was cowering under that. And uh, I, I remember just having this feeling well up in me, like, that has got to stop right now. And I went over to him, and I grabbed some people, and I said, and he, he unfortunately wore braces. And so to sort of teach him a lesson, we started, I started saying, hey, you think she's four eyes? Well, you're tinsel teeth, tinsel teeth, tinsel teeth, tinsel teeth. <laughs> and uh, in a few minutes, I realized that everyone on the playground was now um, kind of yelling at this guy. And I realized that uh, there was going to be a, a big problem if if those nuns came out and saw this riot going on. And, uh, and I realized that I had started it, so I jumped up on the porch on the stoop, and I, and I told him, OK, everyone stop. He's had enough. And everyone stopped. <laughs> and I said, all right, go back and play. <laughs> they just dispersed. And, and, uh, and then I looked at him, and he's, you know, he, now he's cowering. I jumped down, and I said, hey, you know, you, you, know, you, you just can't do that to people. And, you know, you see how that feels? And, oh, yeah, you're right. That was really bad. I feel really bad. And I said, OK, we'll never do that again. And I, and I, and I walked away from that thinking, oh, my gosh. Uh, first of all, I, I just didn't get in a lot of trouble that I probably should have got in. But what was more amazing to me was that I don't know why everyone started to follow that. I don't know why everyone stopped when I told them to. But I realized, oh, my gosh. They're, that was something. I didn't even, I was confused by it. I was, I was, um, I was actually frightened by it a little bit. Uh, but what I've realized as I think on, on, on the actions of my life and some of the things I've stood up for, usually it's, it's an underdog situation where the person who's, um, who's being hurt can't stand up for themselves. And, um, and, and it, it somehow it drives me and it makes, drives me to action. And so, um, that was one of the one of the kind of things that um, I realized at a young age that, that I did have that capacity. Uh, I also had a, I'm, I love what you're doing uh, on this. Inter oh, I just think that's great. One of the things that I realized about cross culture was that uh, we grew up on a farm, but amazingly, I had a lot of cross cultural experiences as a kid. We lived in an area pretty close to a, a rural area that was African American, very poor. And uh, one of my friends at the school invited me to go to her house one night. I was the only white person that ever got invited to go to that area and spend the night. And um, I agree. I, I I said, of course, I would go. And and uh, it was a you know it was an interesting ride to be on a bus with all black people. And uh, I, but when I got there, I realized, and, and they were very poor, much poorer than we were. Uh, but we had such a fun time, and I realized. This is this is there's no reason to be afraid of African Americans. It's it's, I, I and, my, and my mom had a very good African American friend, and she would come to our house with her kids, and we would go to her house, 
And, and somehow I was able to grow up in an incredibly racially tense time thinking that, that there really isn't that much difference between black and white people. And so, um, and, and another thing that happened was uh, we had foreign exchange students that would come and there was an Italian student that, that one of the neighbors had and my mom's parents were immigrants and so she could understand Italian but she couldn't recall it. And he, could, he knew English but he could understand it but he had a hard time recalling it. So they would get together quite often and she would speak to him in English and he would answer her in Italian. And I, I was fascinated by that. I just thought that was amazing that people could talk different languages to each other. So basically growing up, um, I, I, had a, I had some really amazing experiences. Uh, then I got to work as an RA in the dorms at my university. And, and that, was a, that was a really interesting experience um, interculturally too. Um, well, one, of the other, one, one last thing I just want to share about uh, part of my character development was the, the team orientation that I learned early on. Uh, living on a farm, working, doing farm work, you, you have to almost always work in teams. And of course, we did a lot of sports and, and uh, got to play a lot of sports in high school. And um, So I understood that the incredible benefit of being on a team and working on a team and how much, how much more a team can accomplish than an individual can. Um, my family was a good family, but it was not perfect. Um, we grew up with a measure of instability as my dad struggled with uh, the pressures of raising a family. And he took solace uh, by visiting the bars rather frequently. This led to uh, economic problems in our family. We had, um, we had a lot of bills that went unpaid, lots of days where electricity was shut off, the phone was shut off, um, creditors were calling, commitments were uh, compromised. And, and that did sort of put into me a fear that I sort of had this gnawing fear growing up that I would be uh, impoverished and that I would be homeless someday. And it, it really was an irrational fear, but, but it, nonetheless, I had it. And uh, that fear was finally allayed uh, the first time I went to Tijuana, Mexico. I was about 30 years old, and uh, the youth pastor at our church had asked if, we, if I would be willing to go along on the team, help lead the team, and do the translation. And um, I, I found out uh, what real impoverishment was as we crossed the border from San Diego to Tijuana back in 1988. It was, it was really a devastating experience. And um, uh, that, that week, I, um, being there with real poverty, I, um, I realized that at the end of the week I was sitting around talking to some of the neighborhood ladies and we were laughing and um, joking around, and the house was done, and it was a good thing for that family. Um, I mean, the house that we, when we got there, the house that they were living in was built out of sticks and Pampers boxes with a blue tarp. And when we left five days later, there was a two-room house with a cement floor, and uh, and that was pretty pretty big change for them. And and then we were having this great conversation, and I all of a sudden it hit me, I could. I'm not afraid to be poor anymore. I'm not afraid to be impoverished. Because impoverishment is really a lack of relationships. If you have friends, you could live, in, you could live under any circumstance. And uh, that, really, that really moved me. It brought me to a wonderful sense of hope, actually. Which brings me to the theme today, which is hope. Hope and leadership. Hope is the belief that there will be a positive outcome related to events and circumstances in one's life. Like most important things in life, Hope is priceless. It doesn't cost anything. Aristotle called hope a waking dream. When the world says give up, so this is an unknown author, I found this on the, on the internet. When the world says give up, hope whispers, try it one more time. Hope is the driving force which links dreams to action. And why is hope so important to leaders? Well, without hope, not much is ever going to be done. It takes leaders to get people to work together and to get things done. Everything falls and rises. Everything rises and falls on leadership. And leaders must have hope, and they must exhibit that to, their, to those who are following them. Most companies succeed or fail because of their leadership. Organizations even whole countries thrive or fall into ruins 
because of their leadership. A leader must exhibit hope in order to motivate others that their efforts will pay off. They must keep informed and constantly check that their motives are right, and they must act accordingly and lead others to do the same. Hope begins in the dark. This is what Anne Lamott says. Hope begins in the dark, the stubborn hope that if you just show up and do the right thing, the dawn will come. You wait and watch and work. You don't give up. Napoleon Bonaparte said, a leader is a dealer in hope. Why do we need so much hope? Hope speaks to fear and it speaks to despair. And the world, the world is full of both. And that's why we need leaders. We need leaders who will step up in crisis during times of great fear. These leaders need to be courageous. They need to calm people with what they say. They need to speak truth in times of crisis. Truth needs to be spoken. It needs to be remembered. What is the truth here? And they need to give direction. And the greatest example I can think of for this kind of leadership is Rudy Giuliani during 9-11. Rudy Giuliani was the mayor who, uh, of New York that was, he was actually a lame duck mayor. He had not been voted in. He had not been reelected because he was kind of a, kind of a scrappy, harsh guy. And people just didn't like him. He was real black and white. He was an executor, though. He got things done in New York. Crime went down under his administration. But people just didn't like his personality that much. He was a little too strong for everybody. But when 9-11 came, Rudy Giuliani was the person who could speak to fear. He was incredible. He was, he was tireless, and he continually spoke hope into New York City. He not only became the favorite mayor of New York City, but he was named the mayor of the world. Hope speaks to despair. We need leaders who are compassionate that in desperate situations, they will come forth with care and love. They'll be other-centered. They'll think about other people more than themselves. They'll sacrifice. And they'll seek the highest good of everybody around them. Dale Carnegie said, most of the important things in the world have been accomplished by people who have kept on trying when there seemed to be no hope at all. Leaders have to speak to fear and despair and lead people out of that. When I first made that trip to Mexico, my husband Doug was studying, he was finishing up his uh, bachelor and he did his final paper on, uh, it was called How to Help the Poor Locally, Nationally, and Internationally. And uh, one of the things that he studied was um, that, he, that we realized through that study was the immense amount of orphans in the world. And uh, he did some research on different organizations, and we decided at that time that we would um, not have any more of our own children, but that we would adopt from a third world country, preferably South America. We both speak Spanish. And, um, and we also decided to sponsor a child for World Vision at that time. And um, uh, we started to really, uh, dedicate much more of our lives to helping the poor. We went back every year to Mexico to uh, lead teams to build homes. We built about 20 homes there. And um, at the time, I was running a photography business. Doug was running a computer business uh, for over the next 10 or 12 years. And we got to a point in our life where we decided that I should apply for a job as a missions director at a church, which I did, and uh, started to work at Bell Vista Church here in Rockford, Michigan. When I got here, uh, our committee all took a class, a college level class, on the global perspective of missions. And in that class, we learned that, um, that across the board, philanthropically, the gov our government, our churches, individuals, foundations, across the board, 2% of all giving, less than 2%, goes to the 98% poorest people in the world. And 98% of all philanthropic giving stays with the top uh, maybe 6% richest people in the world. And we, we said, well, that's not like us, because our, our church was very missions-minded. And we said, well, um, you know, we're not like that. But we went and did an audit of our, of our, our missions budget. And uh, sure enough, 
we spent about half of our money right in the Grand Rapids in the U.S., which I, I'm all for helping locally. I, I believe what George Bush said uh, at the at the um, at the at the Ford found, at the Ford Center uh, the other day when he said uh, America is big enough to take care of its own problems and help the world. And I really think we are, and I think we should because we're the leaders of the world. And uh, we looked at our budget, sure enough, we spent a bunch here in the U.S. We, we spent, we were supporting some missionaries down in South America, doesn't qualify for third world. Western Europe doesn't qualify for third world. And we had one guy in the Philippines. Guess how much of, his, of our budget he, he covered? Two percent. And we could not believe it. So we, we dedicated ourselves uh, to this knowledge that we would keep all of our commitments. We weren't going to cut off anybody, but we were going to spend any new money on the third world. So I started to travel there. And it didn't take a long time um, to find out <clears throat> that uh, women were really suffering. Uh, by the way, I just want to give it, throw a couple statistics out to you. In the world today, there are about 6.8 billion people, give or take a couple million or several million, and about 3 billion of them live on less than $2 a day. And that's the same $2, it's called purchasing power parity, the same $2 that you can take to the store or to Starbucks or to McDonald's or to iTunes. And that's how much they have to live on to buy their, their housing, their food, their clothing, their medical care, their transportation. $2 a day. Half the world lives on less than $2 a day. And about 1 billion people in the world live on less than $1 a day. They're called extreme poverty. And now I was traveling around in these areas of the world where these people live, and I'm telling you, I was stunned at the plight of women. Um, women suffer so much more disproportionately than men. Women are 80% of the world's farmers, and I'm, I'm telling you, they're not the farmers with big tractors and combines. They work the ground by hand. Because women are responsible, they have all the responsibility and none of the authority to feed their families every day. And when we're talking about living in a place where there's no electricity, no running water, to provide food for your family means that you have to grow it, you have to go down to the river to get the water. Women in Africa walk an average of six miles a day to gather the water for their family's needs. You have to go gather the wood to cook the food that you just grew. So they get up before the sun comes up and they go to bed way after it goes down and they feed their families and if there's any food left, maybe they get to eat. And uh, as I was traveling around the third world, I would see this over and over again. Uh, go into a village and there, all the men would be sitting around drinking tea, playing board games in the shade. And you wouldn't see a woman in sight. And then you would leave the village and there they are, in the fields, walking down to the river, big heavy loads of wood on their back, carrying lots of water, carrying babies. And uh, I said to one of the nurses, we were doing a, a, a trip in Ethiopia, I said, Edith, have you seen, have you noticed this? I said, look at the men. And, uh, and I said, and, and look at the women. And she said, boy, Mary, I've lived here for 32 years, and honestly, I never noticed this. And I said, why do you think it's like that? She said, I, I don't know, that's just the way it is. And I finally came over to my husband and I said, Doug, I, I just feel like, I feel like a lot of people could do my job, but I don't see a lot of people helping women. And so I think I should dedicate the rest of my life's energy to that group, which I think, arguably, is the largest, most oppressed group in the world. Um, they don't have rights. They don't get to own land. Less than 2% of all land in the world is owned by women. They do 70% of the work in the world, and they make about 10% of the income of the world. And the women in the third world, and I, I just want to make a disclaimer here. I, I just want the guys in the room to know, I, I love men. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm inviting you in to this injustice. And I, one of the things I have learned is that um, the only way for people to get out of oppression, there's two ways, actually. 
for people to rise up out of oppression. One is a bloody war where a lot of people die, or those in power peacefully give over their power. And I want to encourage the men in the room. You have power. You have power to change lives. And I invite you into this terrible injustice. And um, my husband's a huge part of this. He, you know, he is a co-founder of So Hope. He is the co-founder. He's actually the founder, really. Mm -hmm. You'll see why in a second. So I said to him, look, I, I, I think I want to go work for a place that's like Rural Vision, you know, targeting uh, basic needs of people. But I want to, you know, Rural Vision targets kids under five. And I said, but I want to, I want to work for an international organization, large-scale international organization, but that does that to women, targets women on very basic, holistic, life-sustaining ways. And he said, okay, I think you should. I think you should do that. You know, here's the green light. Go ahead. Whatever city you have to move to, he's a computer guy. He can, he can move. And uh, so I started to look, and I researched for three months to find an international organization dedicated to women, meeting the basic needs of women. And do you know that in three months, I could not find one? And there are hundreds of these for kids. And I thought, well, I'm either the worst researcher in the world, or there is a huge void in the world. And uh, I, that made me very, very, very uneasy. I really, you know, started to think, I could, I could, I could see that, I could see that this organization, I knew what it was supposed to look like. And I remember praying one day, and I said, God, you know, you really need to get somebody to do one of these organizations. <laughs> and uh, I felt like, God, I felt like I heard God say, I have somebody. And I was, I was kind of relieved, and then I got like this really <laughs> bad feeling in my stomach. And I, I, felt, I felt like I, th I thought I heard God say, well, it's you. And I was like, no, no, not me. Somebody who's qualified, that knows what they're doing. I'm a photographer. And, um, but it became more and more, um, it, it just, uh, we, we couldn't deny it anymore. And finally, uh, I said to Doug, do you really think that we're supposed to do this? And he said, Mary, there should be hundreds of these. Let's start one, make it as simple as possible, and maybe people will copy us, and we can get a movement going. And I said, how, how are we going to do that? And uh, we, we didn't have very much money. And he said, let's, um, he said, I'll sell the land my parents gave me. I had given him um, some land about 10 years earlier, and we were kind of holding that for our retirement. And he said, I'll sell the land in Pennsylvania, and we'll use that. You can quit your job, and you can start the organization. I said, okay, well, I said, I don't want to get to 70 years old and think back and wonder, should I have tried that? I said, I'd really rather try it and fail. And uh, so that's what we did. We had, well, we haven't failed yet. We've tried. <laughs> uh, that's how we started So Hope. And basically, um, about a year into it, uh, I, uh, I realized, I don't know what the heck I'm doing. So I came to Grand Valley and got my master's in public administration. So. Um, I, I came in 2000, I think it was 2007, I graduated in 2010. So trying to start an international organization and get a master's program, I, I just about lost my mind, as you can imagine. But it probably kept me from going crazy. I, I got a lot of help here. I mean, I loved the program here, the students, the energy. And, and this is part of the part of the fruit of getting to come to Grand Valley. I love Grand Valley. Um, you know, Stephen Covey says, uh, he, he writes this book called The Eighth Habit, and his final point is, that you should, to be really effective, you need to find your voice and inspire others to find theirs. And um, I think one of, the, one of the funniest, well, the best examples I have that in my life is I, I went to Ethiopia in 2000. We were doing a, a team was going there. We were, gonna, we were building a school. And in a few days, we realized that, well, the three women on the team, it really wasn't appropriate for us to be helping do, do the brick laying. So I went to the local pastor and I said, hey, you know, if you, if you want to tell the kids uh, in town here, in the village, after school, they could come over, and we'll do like a kids club at the church. And, um, and he said, oh, that, they would love that. And uh, so we went to the local paper store, and uh, stationery store. We bought a ream of paper and about 20 pens, and that was our cra those were our craft supplies. But we, uh, every night, just came up with a program for the next day. We'd pick out a Bible story. We'd tell the story. Then we'd teach them how to do a drama. And, um, and by the way, dramas in, in the third world are great, Bible dramas, because they still live like they did in the Bible times. So when we did like the, the Good Samaritan story, when you know we had the guy beat, beat up down there and everything, which they loved doing that, and, and, uh, and we actually had a donkey 
they actually put the, the guy on the donkey. We had a real donkey for the, for the drone. It was it was awesome. Uh, but but we did we just spent the, we had uh, two of the teachers from the local school came. One was my translator. The other guy was leading music, and we, we just had a wonderful time with them. Um, and about five years later, I went back to visit uh, the the project to see how it was going and things like that. And uh, they asked me to speak in the church, so I stood up and I said, Hey, is anybody here from that group? Uh, that was there, and about about 15 kids raised their hands. So I said, I want to meet with you guys afterwards. So we get, went into a room, went back to the school, and I said, okay, tell me your names and what you're doing. And they started to go around the room, and they would say, I'm so-and-so, and I'm studying to be a teacher. I'm so-and-so, I'm studying to be a nurse. I'm so-and-so, I'm studying to be a pastor. I'm so-and-so, I'm studying to be a politician. And every one of them, they were like 16 to 20 years old, they were all studying and, and going to be something. And I turned to my translator, who was a teacher the first time, now he was the principal of the school, I said, Boru, is it normal that people this age in this village, I mean, this is a really poor village, would still be studying? And he had, his eyes were wide. He said, Mary, this is highly unusual. He said, no, this is, not, this is not normal. So I turned back to the group and I said, hey, how is it that all of you are you know, studying to be something, you know, to be professionals? And one of the guys stood up and he said, Mary, you told us five years ago that we were the hope for Ethiopia, that we should study and become leaders. And that's, and that's why we're all doing that. Wow. I'll, I'll tell you, my first thought was, I said that? <laughs> but I'm telling you, the power of speaking hope to people. We just got a project from that same tribe asking us to support 11 girls to become full-time nurses. And some of them were younger sisters of the, of the kids in that group. Every, everything just kind of go, comes around. In our um, our policy, our strategy at Soul is to um, to use local leaders using local solutions to solve local problems. And what that means is that we have general areas, but we don't tell anybody what to do. We go in and we find local leaders who have a history and a reputation of helping women. We ask them two questions: What are your dreams, and what would you do if you had more resources? And I'm telling you, there is never a lack of an for, of answers for that. And it's always appropriate to whatever they can do. We've had the most amazing responses from our local leaders about how to fix the problems in their areas. And our local leaders, we, we kind of coach them, and we ask them to give us um, targets of how many people they think they're going to impact. Our partners have come back at 30% over their targets. They're very motivated through their projects. You know why? Not because we're paying them to do them, because it was their idea in the first place. Who's not going to make their project work? And it's really a lot of fun, and it's incredibly encouraging. I want to conclude with um, some questions for you guys to think about. I'm really speaking to the students here, and really everybody. I mean, this, this fits everybody, but for, for you guys who are like in your formative years and becoming leaders, I want you to really ask yourself who you are. To thine own self be true. Really think about what is your passion? What moves, excites, and energizes you? What keeps you up at night, late, talking about it or doing it? What would you argue about? Who would you fight for? What makes you stand up? What is your area of influence? Where are you leading now? What group is following you? Who do you care about? Who do you think about? And whose lives are you affecting? If you can answer these questions, it will really guide you in how you should lead. I want to give you a couple of action steps to take. Be active in getting around influential people. It's a great thing that you're sitting in this room. Somebody has identified you as a leader. Sitting next to you are mentors. Use them. This program is fantastic for building leadership. I, I think it'll take you a lot more years to figure out just what an incredible privilege it is to be in this room and a responsibility. Read good books. Use the bibliographies that are uh, provided. I forgot to put one of my favorite books on there.
Call Me Coach by John Wooden. Um, take responsibility whenever you can. Somebody asks you to do something and you can do it, step up and do it, especially if it's an area of your passion. Serve humbly. Always think win-win and grow in your ability to influence. Develop your character by always reflecting on your motives of why you're doing something and then adjust them. We used to always ask people going on the Mexico team, why do you want to go on the Mexico team? And, we, and I'd say, just be honest, what's your motive? And some of the motives weren't very good. And I'd say, or some of them were. You know, I want to travel, I want to, I want to get for my parents. Um, and I'd say, well, okay, those are all, those are all, motives are all fine, but I'm going to tell you what our motives are on this team for this purpose. We have a purpose on this team. And, and it was a church team, and I said, our motives are that we are love, that we love God, that we love each other, and that we love the Mexican people when we get there. If we will live by those three things on this team, we'll be successful. We may not build a house, but we'll be successful. And I'm telling you, the teams that actually followed those things built fantastic houses. Loved the Mexicans. We had tremendous relationships. I still, get, I still go back every year and visit about 13 of the families uh, to see how they're doing. And it's, it's been a tremendous um, experience to watch people grow up in poverty. I'm actually holding babies of babies I held once. Um, so develop your character and understand what's motivating you to do things. And if it's not right, just change your motivation. Keep doing it, but change your motivation. And make it right. My final word, since this is the Center of Presidential Studies, I'm going to quote Woodrow Wilson. You are not here merely to make a living. You are here in order to enable the world to live more amply, with greater vision, with a finer spirit of hope and achievement. You are here to enrich the world, and you impoverish yourself if you forget that errand. Everything rises and falls on leadership. Go and be the kind of leader that raises the bar, that raises the quality of life around those that follow you that raises the good around you. Somewhere, some group, or even just someone, needs your unique style of leadership. Make the world a better place because of your life and efforts. Always do the right thing. And my friends, wherever there is despair, let us sow hope. Thank you. Questions, but I'll be glad to answer any questions. If we oh, and I did have that slideshow if you still want to see it, but anyway, go ahead, yeah. Um, do you have uh, any idea of the, has there been like an increase in organizations that are targeting um, Latinx and Latino communities or something like that? You know, after we started Soho, CARE International changed their vision to, uh, to making women a priority. I'm not sure it's their only vision, mm -hmm. but I think if CARE had been doing what they're doing now, I probably would have gone and worked for them. So I think they probably heard about So Hope and decided we better change our vision. <laughs> there are there are lots of organizations that do one thing, maybe internationally, like maybe they do microloans, or there's an organization that might be uh, that might go into one country and and be um, helping women as a as a focus. But what I what I was looking for was that kind of large scale, basic care uh, organization, which I do think there needs to be tens at least of them in the world. Yep. Um, in the readings for today, it mentioned uh, that you've had conversations with men about um, abusing their wives. And I was just wondering, I mean, how do those conversations go? And have you, I mean, have you convinced anyone to stop? I mean, First of all, I, I don't tell anybody to stop abusing their wives. Okay. Um, what I was, what happened there was we were in the Congo and we were going village to village and I was talking to women, group, women's groups who, were, who had been raped. And for the third village, the guy that was taking us around, uh, he said, he actually was a young guy, his dad was a local politician, he had set up all these meetings. And the dad told the son to come and tell me as I came out of one of the huts, hey, tell Mary there's a group of men over here that, that need, they want to be talked to too. Mary's, she's ignoring the men and um, they're feeling neglected. So uh, if she could come and talk to them, that'd be great. And, and, and I've always heard people, people are saying to me a lot, and I agree with this, 
if you want to change the life of a woman in Africa, then you need to change the men. And, and my response is absolutely, I totally agree with that. But you know what? Really, there's not, really, how much could a short, white, fat lady from Michigan do to change the minds of African men? I said, how about if I help women, and I just do that, and then somebody else comes along and talks to the men? Well, now this guy says, come and talk to, I've got a group of men, come and talk to them. And my response was, well, what does he want me to say? And he said, you know, do your thing. Just do your thing. <laughs> and they're really there, literally waiting for me about where that table's at. And there's about 20 guys waiting for me to come over and be, they want me to encourage them. And so I walked up and I said, uh, well, I just want you to know we are, we are an organization that promotes women because we feel like women suffer more than men. But we love men and, and we respect men. And I said, and I want to talk about respect. And then I went into this thing about you can get respect two ways, through fear, but really through love. And, um, and, uh, and when I talked about that, I just said, you, you, can, you can get respect by coming home and beating everybody up, but when you, when you come home, nobody's gonna, nobody wants you there. When you leave, everybody's happy. And when you die, there's going to be rejoicing. But if you learn this one little trick, if you learn how to love your wives, love your kids, and love your neighbors, then when you come home, they'll be glad to see you. They'll be sad when you leave. And when you die, your name will go down with uh, honor. <coughs> and, and they liked it. The, the guy came up to me afterwards. The, the son came up and said, my dad has never heard a message like that. And you are going to say that in every village that we go into. <laughs> and sure enough. So I guess there is something a little short white lady from Michigan can say that. You might want to briefly mention the Bangladesh woman Oh yeah, when, when I first went to Bangladesh and sat in on one of our micro loans, they, they do a weekly training and the, tr the, uh, the trainer was telling the women, um, don't let your husbands beat you. Uh, if they do, then tell them to stop. If he won't stop, tell the, tell the group to tell him to stop. If the group, if he still doesn't stop, then you tell him to tell me. And this trainer was about as tall as me, you know, maybe like this, you know, maybe even a little shorter than me. So after the meeting, I said to her, you know, that was a great talk, but um, seriously, why would, why would anybody listen, you know, to, to you? And she said, and I said, have, have they ever done that? And she said, well, just two weeks ago, one of the guys here wouldn't let his wife come to the meeting. And so I went to him and I said, you need to apologize to me. And he wouldn't do it. So some other men came, husbands of other wives in the club, and they took him out and he, they talked to him and he came back. And he apologized to her, and I said, now why would he do that? She said, Mary, I have the power to pull the loans in this village. And if I pull the loans in the village, the economy here will collapse. So uh, what happens if this one guy ruins it for everybody else? There's no way. The other husbands aren't going to allow it. And what we saw, we had a, we had a three-year program going. Those clubs that had been going for the full three years, the husbands were extremely engaged with their wives and proud of their wives and working with their wives. And uh, when you let the local people, the local leaders, move the culture, they can do it in increments that's acceptable. If I go in and say, husband, stop being your wife, I say, well, you're just, you know, what do you have? Why, why should I listen to you? But when the local husbands are telling the other husband, you need to stop this because all of our lives now depend on this, then you can move a culture slowly. And I, I'm a firm believer that I, I am not, I do not want to criticize, I don't, I don't want to criticize men. I don't want to criticize cultures. I want to criticize countries. I really want people to, to, to really start coming together. And, and when you start to tell people what not to do, it causes a lot of negative energy. And, um, and I think it can be better done by saying more positive kinds of things. And I, I want to be able to get visas to go to countries. And so um, I'm not going to come out against, you know, countries. So, and, and I, I actually, um, yeah, that answers your question. It does. This is one more question. <coughs> yep. Um, starting a nonprofit organization, it's, it's an overwhelming task. Oh, it's really easy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. Well, what, if you could just talk about what the first couple of steps you took to kind of get it going, get it off the ground. Yeah, I pulled, in, I pulled in a lady who was an executive director of an organization, and she was a board president of a multi-million dollar nonprofit, and she helped me write the bylaws. That was the first step. Okay. And she really guided me. And then along the way, I kept getting more and more excellent guidance. Um, and then when I took the, the degree here, that really helped too. 
But you just, uh, basically you set the foundation. I told her I want the best foundation possible for this organization. I, don't, I want this to go way beyond my life. And so as we went through the bylaws, we got to one that said um, no conflicts of interest and who could be on the board. And basically we got to the point with the discussion of anybody being paid shouldn't be on the board. And um, I said, well, that, I, I think I'm going to be paid because I'm probably going to be the first you know, president. Well, then you really shouldn't be on the board. And neither should your husband. And I was like, well, uh, are you serious? Because we just give up our whole you know, future, basically, for this. Do you want the best organization possible? Yeah, she, well, I'll tell you what she said. She goes, I'm going to go home. You, you sleep on this tonight. You can tell me tomorrow what you want. Well, I didn't sleep at all that night. But when she came back the next day, I said, I want the best organization possible. We'll write it in there. No, nobody who's paid can be on the board. So I'm not even on my own board. I was on the board for like four hours when we founded it, and then we named it. <laughs> Doug and I were both on the, on the initial board, and then we turned it over that night to another. We nominated a whole new board. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know what to say from what I just heard, but I think I, think I speak for all of us. That was an incredibly moving uh, presentation. You really are an inspiration. And uh, when I think of the way you have founded an organization called So Hope, and I look at your heart, and you sow hope just by your presence. Well, thank you. Thank you very much.